Hello, Mark Sanborn. Welcome to the Doing CX Right Show. Thank you, Stacey. Lovely to be here. We, we've scheduled this now since 1952. Every <laughs> week we try to get together and it finally, the, the, the plan became a reality. So delighted to be with you. Well, I hope that I could get through this without belly laughing the entire time. And I have to say, thank you, the NSA National Speakers Association, because I was in the room with you. And truth be told that a guy pointed to me and pointed to you and said, Stacy, you got to have him on your show. And I'm like, what do you mean? So I went up to you. You didn't know who the heck I was. And magic happened. Well, and you were a very nice person. Then you were convinced that I did not remember you every time I saw you. So we have a, a running joke. We always like sign off with guess who. <laughs> yeah, it's NSA, true. And it's a wonderful organization for, for, especially for speakers and those that make their living through the spoken word. And uh, you and I have many great mutual friends through that association. Absolutely. So we'll make sure that they hear this because they'll be so proud that they connected one more, uh, one more of many, many relationships. And, so and because let's I'm talk- vain, I normally don't wear glasses. I, I told you this before the show. Uh, I wore glasses yeah. once. And somebody said, that makes you look even older. And I'm at the age where even older is a bad thing. So, uh, <laughs> but I also can't see my computer screen. I can see, uh, you know, a goose flying three miles in the distance, but I cannot see my computer screen. So if (laughs) if for for your listeners that are watching, envision me without glasses. I look at least three or four months younger. Well, all right. So promise people watching you will understand. And those listening on the audio channels, they won't know what the heck you're talking about. So let's get started into who are you? What do you do professionally? For nearly 40 years, I've been a full-time professional speaker, author, and advisor. I never really hung out a consulting shingle, which is a story I won't get into here, other than to say, just because you have expertise in one area doesn't necessarily mean it translates to another area. And so my strength has been uh, the spoken word from the stage, uh, as well as uh, training and development, and then doing one-on-one advising. But basically, I started back in uh, 19... 86, doing public seminars for a couple of years. And uh, for a brief time, I was a trainer doing Tom Peters in Search of Excellence program, which by the way, I was licensed for, I was approved to do. This wasn't like I was stealing his material like the rest of the world. But one of the things that Tom really impressed upon me was the importance of service. Of course, I've been a customer. We all have been our entire lives. And I had a wonderful perspective about being on the receiving end of customer service. but these past many years, I've really developed two areas of expertise. One is leadership, which is what I think I'm most well known for. But the other is not just how to provide great service, but how to provide different and distinctive service. Because sameness sucks. You know, if you do the same thing everybody else does, you're not memorable, you're interchangeable. And the key is not to just be different, because I'm I'm opposed to this idea that different is better. Not always. Sometimes different is dumb. You know, sometimes different is strange or off-putting or weird. But really the sweet spot in the customer experience is being different in a way that sets you apart and that your customers and prospects value. Sameness sucks. That's just should be that needs to be a bumper sticker. I don't get it. It needs to be a (laughs) it needs to be a bumper sticker. (laughs) (laughs) If they make those anymore. And then if somebody with that bumper sticker sees another bumper sticker that says the same thing, then you've got an existential dilemma. That's so perfect. Well, before we get into that, let me ask you, what inspired you to be about so entrenched in customer experience and speaking and teaching and all that you described? Well, I got interested in speaking literally when I was 10 years old. I entered a competition did so badly, was so humiliated that it it challenged me to learn how to be a public speaker. And later, and it's funny, I just uh, was looking through a book I sent my parents in uh, December of 1978. I went to a program, heard Zig Ziglar, bought a book I thought my parents would enjoy and said, uh, I decided today, someday I want to be a professional speaker. So I kind of have a, the, the exact moment, if you will, in time when I decided 
this was something I wanted to do. The problem is, you know, when you're in college, you, you have, you may have the ability to communicate well, but you may not have much life experience or expertise to communicate. So I kind of parallel process, you know, I've always, I always tell people I'm not a, a business speaker. I'm a business person that speaks. Uh, to me, business is central. Speaking is just how I uh, convey the ideas that I have. And, uh, you know, after working now with over 3,000 clients, the beautiful thing is I've learned from every one. Occasionally, I've learned what not to do. But I have kind of this this large uh, amount of work to draw from and to make new connections for my clients. So, you know, I got interested. I, I love leadership especially. And, um, you know, I, all great leaders serve, uh, it, you know, yeah. maybe not in the traditional sense of customer service, but... Like Bob Dylan said famously, everybody's got to serve somebody. So uh, that's probably how those two topics fit together for me. Hmm. What does doing CX right mean to you and being extraordinary? Well, two things. One that you you may not know, but I'm kind of, and, and I'm a great fan of uh, Pine and Gilmore who wrote the customer experience or the experience economy, excuse me, many, many years ago, over 25 years ago. I personally believe that uh, experience has changed, that uh, CX is a tool, not a goal, and that the real goal is how that experience makes the customer feel. I wrote about in my last book uh, that we now do business in the emotion economy and that the real challenge, and I rarely see companies do this, is to design and deliver for positive emotion. Well, the Fred factor uh, is about a real-life postal carrier, now retired, and, you know, I say that the Fred factor is the ability to continually add new value to the people you live and work with, because truth is transferable through passion, creativity, and commitment. And those are three things you control. It doesn't matter if you're, you don't need a budget for those. You don't need approval. Uh, what's interesting to me is I think people kind of misunderstand the word extraordinary, just like we misuse quantum leap. See, in physics, it's usually referred to as a quantum jump, not a quantum leap. And it's actually the smallest distance an atom can travel from one level to another. And yet in life, we think quantum leaps are the things that change the world, solve a universal problem or set a record. And those are, I suppose, quantum leaps. But more often than not, quantum leaps are little changes. And extraordinary means just a little extra more than ordinary. And and I hope people aren't put off by that because, you know, the, the hero of the Fred factor, Fred Shea, He didn't start work two hours early. He didn't work two hours late. It wasn't the work that he did that made him so well known. It was how he did the work. And that's what being Mm -hmm. extraordinary is to me. It's about doing your job in such a way that, uh, as as Martin Luther King uh, once said, and I paraphrase, that all the hosts of heaven look down and say, there lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. And he was basically referring to whatever work you did, do it well. Wow, a lot to unpack there. So for people who haven't read The Fred Factor and the 20th edition's coming, so they'll have a chance to have a revived Fred. Mm -hmm. What is Fred about without giving it too much away? Well, the the Fred Factor is what I I just uh, explained as the ability to create new value through three things you control. But it's based on four principles. Which, by the way, I never intended it to be a customer service book. Uh, I love business philosophy. Philosophy answers the question, how should we live? So business philosophy answers the question, how should we do business? So I wrote it as a business philosophy book. Everybody bought it as a customer service book. And I thought, I don't care what you think it is as long as you buy a gun So So um, <laughs> it, it really is, I think, niched as a customer service book, although... I I, I use it with sales professionals. I use it with C-level executives. It it applies to everyone. But there are four principles. Number one is a reminder that people often forget. Everyone makes a difference. There's no neutrality, really, in a practical level. The only question is, what kind of difference do you make? Are you choosing in your interactions every day to make a positive difference? Uh, Number two, it's all built on relationship. Uh, Ultimately, what differentiates any product, service, experience, or emotion it's created through the relationship or the, the connection that you have with your with your customer. Uh, number three is my favorite, and that's you can add value; doesn't have to cost a nickel. 
because I've spent a lot of time studying how great companies outthink rather than outspend their competition. And then number four is is a personal uh, foundation that says you've got to reinvent yourself every day. Uh, don't wait for someone to motivate the motivator. Uh, you know, make it an inside job because uh, I think the ultimate sin in leadership and customer service is being boring. Uh, you want to be engaging and you want to be enticing and you want to be an uh, expert, but you don't want to be boring. So those are the four principles. A- anybody that wants to read the first chapter of the book, called The First Fred I Ever Met. They can just go to fredfactor.com. I know you have show notes. But uh, fredfactor.com, you can read the, the the story of The First Fred I Ever Met, who is Fred Shea. Hmm. So how people listening to this, it sounds wonderful. It sounds simple. We know it's not. <laughs> What are things that you instruct companies to be able to actually apply it tactically? What do they do to apply it to win? And how do they know they're doing it right? Is there such a measurement of such a Fred? Yeah, you know, KPIs are are popular, of course. Um, You know, they say the old saying says sometimes the, the most important things in life you can't measure. You can certainly assess them qualitatively, if not quantitatively. But let me kind of shrink that big question down into this this answer. And that is, you know, we all know the Bain and Company net promoter scores. Seems like every other client I work with uses that. Bain and Company has made a lot more money from their question than my question. But (laughs) my question, which really is what the Fred Factor is all about, is are you happier you chose us than a competitor? Are you happier when you leave than when you came in? Are you happier when you hung up the phone than when you called and dialed in? Because if the answer to that is yes, you've created one of 28 primary emotions, which is happiness. And ultimately, every product or service is not an end, is not, is not an end. It's a, a means to an end. We want our lives to be better. We want to be more successful and happier and healthier. And if we only focus on the product, you know, as we used to say in the ancient days of selling, you know, the steak and not the sizzle, um, we limit our palate when it comes to CX or selling or leadership for that matter. So, you know, the Sanborn question is, are you happier you chose us? Uh, and, and if you can design and deliver a consistent experience, so the answer to that is yes, uh, then, then you've been successful. Hmm. That has such a nice sound to it. And then obviously really dig into the why. Why are you happier or the, the, the corollary, why aren't you? Because it, it, the why aren't you is, I think, more instructive uh, in terms of being diagnostic and what needs to change. You know, the, the, the thing, Stacey, is frontline people are the... It's, it's funny. You go to a hotel, you know, I work with leaders. And uh, you go to a hotel, you never meet a formal leader unless you have a problem. And then you might meet the GM. You know, the GM is the big mucky muck, the man or woman in charge of the whole operation. And if you're really pissed off, they will talk to you and try to make you happy again. But everybody who creates your experience is a frontline employee, you know, from the bell cap to the uh, valet to the, the desk reception to room service to housekeeping. And yet, to this day, the majority of training in corporate America still goes to that tiny percentage of executives who you rarely see. They're important, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they're not. But I wish we did as as much uh, good training the people, and, and that's what I try to do in the book. I try to give them not just the principle, but very specific applications, little things they can do. Like if you're delivering pizza, and I've had a lot of pizza companies all the way from Domino's down to little regional ones. I said, you're delivering pizza, carry a bag of candy. Every house in America with a little kid, the kid goes to the door to help mom or dad get the pizza. And you simply say, is it okay if I give your son or daughter a piece of candy? And if they say it is, and you give that kid a piece of candy, you own that house. Because every time you talk about pizza, little Johnny or little Jill says, mommy, mommy, I want the man that gives me candy. Well, that's why I think it's so amazing about CX and and customer service. It is so commonsensical. It is so intuitive. And yet, I think like most things in life, we just don't think about it. And that's really what I get paid to do. I have time to think about it. And then I, I share what I came up with. So to add on to that, not only do you think about it, I know in my world, 
I'm obsessed about it. I can't go anywhere. And now my kids can't either (laughs) without seeing and telling me a story or that I am. And sometimes the biggest joke in my home is, you know, Stacey, why are you calling customer care? Just just look up at the FAQ or whatever. And I'm like, no, I want to hear the experience. I want to know how they resolve this. <laughs> I'm well, determined. <laughs> I'm with you. I, mean, I call it, I have five levels of, uh, of expertise and the highest, uh, next to the highest is immersed. The highest is innovative. But it's interesting. I also think being involved in service training and development, we're jinxed in a way because I have stuff happens to, that happens to me. It's almost like they're like the anti-service demons of the universe are following me around. You know, I can't even order from Uber Eats without having a brain aneurysm because my food gets here ice cold and the order's wrong. And they they are now, I believe, I can't prove this, using AI as their first line of um, interaction with customers because I actually said to the agent, I said, you're AI, aren't you? And it was like, well, sir, I'm so sorry you've had this experience. Because wouldn't you expect a non-AI bot to say, oh, no, 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 no. My name is Gladys. I live in uh, in, in East Des Moines. So, yeah, everything is, is fodder, right? Now, I'll tell you what's frustrating. I don't want to go too far afield, but it's what I do. Um, as a leadership speaker, I wish I could talk about politics without everybody getting so incensed. It doesn't matter if I'm conservative, liberal, Republican, progressive, Democrat. There's so much instruction lately how not to do it, but I can't even bring up, if I use a political example, I'm just instantly exercised for, for, you know, for blasphemy. And it's really sad because you can learn a lot by watching the political process. A lot of what is is right and, and a lot of what is wrong. But yeah, I'm like you. I'm immersed. And I try to be innovative. I try to take it to the next level. So this is not about a speaking career, but I'm going to say one more comment and then we'll go, we'll continue on. But you just hit a trigger, which I guess is what everybody needs to be aware of is that we can't change all the, the sensitivities in the world. However, we need to be aware. And so when I was speaking, (laughs) <laughs> I use the word uh, tribe, you know, you're part of the tribe. And someone said to me offline, mm, don't use that word. I'm like, what do you mean? Okay, so look, that's not what this show is. That <laughs> there is, we do need to be impeccable with our words uh, from my favorite author, uh, The Four Agreements. But yes, yes, customer words, service, words, customer words, experience. Words matter, but meaning matters more. And it's easy for people who are ill-informed or uninformed to get hung up on words rather than looking at the greater context. I can use a vanilla, plain vanilla word in one context and be hateful in another context and be loving. And yet we get hung up on the word, not the context. So we, yeah, I'm glad I'm not the only one that digresses. We're good. Good. I knew we were like money. That's why, that's why we, got, we hit it off at NSA. Yes, we did. And and so listeners going through this babble with us, recognize your words matter to your customers, to your employees, to your colleagues. So there is a point to this. But let's get back to the AI, artificial intelligence. We know you've got to embrace it. We also know people are scared, okay? Yeah. The workforce has changed. We know that. So what does the research reveal to you in how do you lead the change so that AI can enhance experiences and not replace it completely? Well, first of all, you know, we were talking offline about disagreements among experts. You know, there's there's no unanimous opinion. Uh, is AI going to destroy the world or save it? Um, We thought, for instance, and this I think is instructive, that AI would come for the menial jobs and that the poor truck driver would no longer be driving his truck. And it was the exact opposite. AI came for the creative jobs because the truck driver is still sitting in in his or her cab driving the truck. But the people who are cranking out copy, maybe not very good copy, they're the ones that really have to to pay attention. I I think that there's two things that I... It's a big subject. I... 
I've got so many friends that are really good at it. I try not to say too much about it because everybody these days can teach you how to make a million dollars using AI. I would just say two things. One is the, the purpose of AI is AI, artificial intelligence that amplifies your intelligence. I use it as a tool. Uh, I don't just write a blog using AI. I do the heavy lifting of finding data and context and illustrations and structure. And then I go through and I edit it. So I'm smarter. It's kind of like saying to somebody who's a carpenter, you know, this hammer thing, it's really not fair. Stick to using a rock. Because if you can't pound nails with a rock, it's not really your work. The hammer's do For the love of Pete, AI is a tool. Secondly, this is, I think, important. There's three things that AI can't do. People say, what, what is my role in the age of AI? First of all, it's... Um, asking correctly. It's, it's inputs, if you will. It's questions. Uh, because that's still something that, that AI can't do. Although I just got something uh, over the in my e uh, mailbox today that talks about a self-prompting AI program. So for right now, inputs and prompts are still what employees do. Number two, and they'll always do this, it's judgment. And that is, Taking what AI gives you, assessing, is it accurate? Does it ring true? Does it make sense? Is it what we, we really need? And the third thing is implementation. AI can tell you a lot of stuff, but somebody's still got to do it. And uh, other than the, the coming up with the content and the ideas, and, and I know now, and, and the real cynics going, oh, wait a minute, you can make movies now with the verbal prompts. Yeah, but you still got to go. I go back to my first idea. You still got to come up with the inputs or, or the questions. So, you know, questions and judgment and implementation are three jobs that aren't going anywhere soon. And, and in the world of AI, that's what I think we all need to focus on. Mm. I have a huge pet peeve now. You just talked about you not using the AI to write your blog. I literally like, scratch nails on a scratch board when i'm seeing content out there it's so obvious that chat gpt wrote this yeah. the words are just so clear that like at least try to mask it <laughs> at least try to put some of your own words because it just takes away from wanting to engage and that personal factor, I mean, it's, God, it, be aware, people. There, yeah, there's an easy way to identify or to distinguish between good AI and bad AI when it comes to content creation. For years, um, when speak, speaking coaches, the speaking coaches are still pretty popular, but there was a while where they were a kind of a craze, you know, and uh, I, I could listen to a speaker on stage and know who their coach was. That's bad coaching. I could listen to a speaker that I knew had a coach, but I couldn't tell who the coach was. That's good speaking. Because they had taken the technique yeah. and implement and integrated it with their own personality, style, and ability. And it's the same with AI. You know, I'm like you. I could spot cheesy AI copy a mile away. But there's two things. One is a lot of us now, uh, and I'm sure you are too, teach AI to write in our voice. Because AI is a pretty good learner. And, uh, you know, you had enough data. Hey, I can start to kind of get a grasp on how you write. But the second thing is, is, you know, there, there, it's the mechanics versus the artistry. AI to me provides the engine block. I've still got to tune it. And so, um, yeah, good AI is, is indistinguishable from, from good non AI copy. If you can, if you can recognize that it's bad AI or you, oh, more correctly, you used it poorly. It's not bad. See, we've yeah. started to attribute human characteristics. <laughs> witch. AI, AI witch, that nasty AI. No, we're, we're, we're now using human attributes to describe AI. Well, the, the, maybe the next edition of the Fred Factor is going to be AI Fred. <laughs> I know. Watch out. Yeah. Watch out. Yeah. <laughs> so as we're getting to the end, some rapid fire here questions. Uh, leadership, best leadership advice that you've received or given, what would you say? Well, I'm, it's not the best, but two of the best ideas that have stuck with me over many, many years. First, when I was in uh, high school, I met a state senator 
in, in Ohio where I grew up and I was interested in speaking. I asked him what it took to be a good speaker. And he said, Mark, always remember people want to be entertained. And I would have, pro- I probably have uh, uh, adjusted that word to engaged because sometimes entertainment's not enough. But if you can't mm-hmm. engage an audience, they're not going to learn from you. They're not going to be influenced by you. They're not going to take action because of you. So that to me was one of the classic bits of advice I was uh, glad to receive. The other one is from former Attorney General John uh, Ashcroft, who, who I've been a big fan of over the years, never met him. But when I was NSA president way, way, way back in 2004, I read something that was so helpful. Uh, and it was a quote from John Ashcroft who said, when you are a leader, many will befriend you, but not all will be your friend. And mm-hmm. anybody that's been in a leadership position knows how hard it is to distinguish between people who really are supporting you and who are really using you as a means to what they want. And and I thought that was such an eloquent way. And, you know, after I was NSA president, a lot of my, not friends, but the befriended, you know, they disappeared and they started to befriend the next program chair, the next president. That's true in all organizations. That's not unique to any one organization. So those are two of my favorites. Yeah, I would say having ranked, gone up the corporate ladder, I'd say got lonely at the top. Yes. Uh, oh, that's good. And I also love about laughter and storytelling. And um, gosh, I just came back from speaking and the microphone didn't work towards my vid. Uh, sorry, the video didn't work. And so I had to lean in with my microphone to the computer so it would go up on the speakers <laughs> and it didn't work. When I tell you that I just had to turn, I was going to cry or laugh. So I laughed laughed at myself, got the crowd laughing. And that was the only way to be memorable and resilient. So every, every failure has a seed of opportunity. I interviewed Stephen Covey years ago. We were both lapel mic He had his famous walking, talking, thinking stick with him. We were standing fairly close on stage and his mic went out. And they, were, they had a runner who was bringing up a handheld. I'll never forget. Stephen reached across, plucked my mic off, and leaned down and kept going. So I just put my arm around Stephen and stood there like, you know, we were like joined at the hip and besties. And and the audience loved it. And of course, what was really cool is Stephen was nonplussed. He he continued to share great ideas. But when, when bad stuff happens, your first thought is, I'm doomed. It's over. I'll never work again. But more often than not... Uh, People actually like you when stuff goes wrong. Why? Because they live lives where stuff goes wrong. So it's a way to be more human. Oh, I felt very human in that room. So uh, laugh at ourselves, laugh laugh with us, laugh not at us too hard. Uh, CEOs, entrepreneurs, leaders in my room right now, if they were here, what's that one takeaway you want them to remember today? Well, the big one right now that I want to impress upon him is from my book, The Intention Imperative. Uh, For 30 plus years, I was asked, you know, what do all successful leaders have in common? Sometimes the question was, what do all successful people have in common? And I always was honest. I don't know. I, I worked with people that do a lot wrong, but somehow get it right. And I've worked with people who do a lot right, but somehow got it wrong. So I knew what successful people often did, but I didn't know what that one thing was. And I, I've come to believe that I was able to identify that. And that is that all successful leaders and all successful people are intentional. Mm. You don't reach the top of Mount Everest accidentally. Nobody ends up there like, oh, I was walking the dog and wait, wait a minute, this is the highest peak in the world. No, it, it takes incredible intention and, and preparation. So intentionality, I define simply as this. And it sounds simple, but the simplest things, as you said earlier, Stacey, are sometimes the hardest to do. Number one, be crystal clear on what you're trying to accomplish. And I bet if you ask a dozen employees in your company right now, whoever you are, wherever you're listening from, what the company is about, why do we exist? Why are we doing what we're doing? What are we trying to achieve? You get a dozen different answers. So intentionality is about being crystal clear on what you're trying to accomplish. And then secondarily, taking correct action every day to achieve it. And the reason I say correct action and every day, one is it's got to be consistent. But two, correct action changes. What was correct action pre-COVID maybe wasn't correct action during COVID or post-COVID. And so I think you and I in our work, leadership and CX, 
you know, we're about kind of keeping our eyes on what are those correct actions, knowing what it is you want to achieve as a leader. What are those correct actions you and your team need to be taking every day? And close the loop, people. Close the loop. Another story, another day. What would you tell the younger 20-year-old self? What would you tell your 20-year-old self if you could go back in time what you know oh, now I, that you I, didn't know then? Yeah. For whatever I'd tell me, I wouldn't listen to. That, that's the worst part. You know, maybe, maybe one thing is, is listen better. But no, you know, th- this is so cliche, so cliche. And I apologize. But number one is uh, take yourself less seriously. Uh, I, I have always been a moderately intense person. And it took me a long time to figure out that intense mm-hmm. is a good thing and a bad thing. And uh, I take what I do very seriously. And again, this is not new, I- a new idea you've not heard. Uh, I take what you do seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. I, I was derailed, upset, flustered, depressed, had high levels of anxiety. And, and now these many years later, I go, well, that was a waste of energy in life. Second thing is, I would say uh-huh. aim higher. You know, my friend Nito Cobain says, you know, don't hunt for rabbits, hunt for elephants. When you're out there, uh, you know, it's just as easy. Matter, matter of fact, in some metaphorical weird way, it's easier to see an elephant. By the way, if you remember, Pete, I'm not suggesting shooting an elephant. I'm talking about hunting for one metaphorically here. And, and so I, I look back and I go, you know, when I was in college, my roommate was studying the, all the muscles in a cat. And I'm like, why? He goes, because I'm pre-med. I said, why are you pre-med? He says, because I'm going to be a doctor. And I, I'll never forget. I said, what, what, what made you decide to be a doctor? He goes, well, my grandfather was a doctor. My dad was a doctor. What else was I going to do? I'm going to be a doctor. And I had an epiphany. I was studying ag economics because my grandfather was a farmer. My dad yeah. was a farmer in an ag business. What else was I going to do except go into ag business? And I realized and it's not a bad thing. It's just how narrowly focused we become because of our surroundings. I could have been a doctor. I don't know if I would have been. I mean, I, I'm not sure I would have wanted to be a doctor, but it never crossed my mind. And so, um, you know, the great news, I guess, maybe a good way to end is, is we can be almost anything we want. We just can't be everything we want. We've got to prioritize and focus on what really matters. Beautifully said. And last thing to what you said about elephants. I would like to live in a world where we take elephants out of the room. (laughs) So so (laughs) much is... Yeah, like... it, But so much we're more in rooms with people. Everybody's just so... Like, just keep it real, people. Let's just get honest and transparent and, oh, don't get me started. Thank you for being here, sharing your wisdom, and I will definitely have the ways to connect with you and find you and celebrate your new 20th, not new, the 20th edition of The Fred Factor, which is so exciting. And thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you, Stacey. 